Welcome to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. This week, we are going back to the 90s. And one of the best things about that decade was that it was a truly glorious time for chick rock. <laughs> Women never had more of a presence in rock and roll than they did during this period. It was so big that they had a whole touring festival, Lilith Fair, devoted to it. And then everything got replaced by bro suck rock and nothing was ever good again. But for a while, it was great. And somehow, despite my love of 90s alt rock, I have never covered one of the many alternative women on this show, so I figured I might as well cover the biggest one hit wonder from this subgenre. But this one's kind of fraught. I'm a bitch, I'm a lover, I'm a child, I'm a In 1997, Meredith Brooks shocked America with a single word, and she did not feel ashamed. I do not feel ashamed. Rebelling against the culture of enforced femininity, her song, Bitch, rose all the way to number two in the summer of 1997, striking a bold blow against the patriarchy or something. I hate the world today. This is a song that I probably should have covered a long time ago, and I haven't, because, quite frankly, I don't like this song, and I never have. And I was afraid to say that for a long time, because... The song Bitch seemed to mean something to a lot of women, something empowering, made them feel like they were allowed to be messy and contradictory and pissed off sometimes if they were angry, goddammit. So for me, it was like, you know, way to go, Todd, you're gonna shit all over this. What's the matter, you chauvinist pig? You can't handle an outspoken woman? So I was thinking maybe I'd just keep this one in my pocket. But 1997 was a long time ago, and this song has aged very strangely. At one time, I think at least some people really did consider this to be bold and challenging, but since then, the song has become more of a meme than anything. It certainly hasn't gone away, but I think it's more seen now as part of a long tradition of well-intentioned but corny pop feminism that seems kind of shallow and embarrassing in hindsight. Is that fair? I think that a song with this kind of longevity sort of deserves more consideration than that, so I may wind up defending it more than I expected to. As befitting a song about the complexities of womanhood, it leaves a complicated legacy. Who was Meredith Brooks, and what are we to make of her biggest hit? Was it a raging blow against sexism, or was it just girl power smash mouth? We shall see. Tomorrow I will change, and today won't mean a thing. I'm a I realize it is gauche to talk about a woman's age, but Meredith got her big break pretty late. Articles from the Times said she was 31, Wikipedia now says she was 38, I don't know which one's right, but either way, that's some persistence in a really ageist music industry that doesn't have any use for women past age 26. So yeah, she'd been trying to make it for a while. As you can tell from the cover art of this much earlier single of hers, nice 1984 hair. But in 1989, she finally got her first major label record deal. Or more accurately, one of the Go-Go's got a record deal and she was on it. This is the all-girl band The Graces, led by Charlotte Caffey, formerly the lead guitarist and main songwriter for the Go-Go's. That's Meredith there on the right. The Graces put out one album in 1989. It sounds weirdly more like the Bangles than the Go-Go's. They had one minor single that didn't crack the top 40 and the album tanked. Meredith has said the experience is great, but the Go-Go's came up together in the punk scene. The Graces were manufactured by a label and it just never felt legit. Meredith quit the band to find her own way. I don't know what she did for the next eight years, but I do know what was happening in the background. In the early 90s, a new female punk movement called Riot Girl started springing up. Within a couple years, the unapologetically female anger it pioneered had bled over to mainstream artists, the most famous example of which being... In 1995, former Canadian teen pop star Alanis Morissette releases her first American record, Jagged Little Pill. By 1996, she is the biggest star in music. You know, today, record labels are looking for the next Billie Eilish. Last decade, they were looking for the next Lord. In the 90s, they were looking for the next Alanis. Meredith claims she got signed before Jagged Little Pill took off, but Alanis will loom large over the rest of her career. But for a while, it didn't look like Meredith was going to be the next anything. She kept turning in songs, the label was just never impressed, 
She was collaborating with an industry songwriter, Shelly Pikin, to try and find something. I was feeling kind of stressed out, kind of PMS-y, kind of bitchy, and I had this thought. Meredith co-wrote the song, but it was Shelly Pikin's original concept. She was in a bad mood one day because she'd been in the industry for 10 years and none of the songs she had sold had become hits. And then she got to think about how understanding her man was, even when she was being pissy like this, and that's where the song comes from. So, it's kind of a love song, really. I called Meredith. She totally got it, because she was that bitch, too. Ha. <laughs> now, the two of them have a lot to say now about how empowering it is to flip that insult around. There's definitely a side of me that can be what society calls as a bitch. But what I wanted to do is, is change the meaning of the word by using my semantic realignment theory and <clears throat> take the negative meaning off the word. But her so. producer says that when she first brought it in, she was worried that they'd written an anti-feminist song, and the producer was like, no, you've hit on something very powerful here. Her producer, by the way, was a guy named Geza X, a guy who'd already produced some all-time classic pop songs, like Holiday in Cambodia by the Dead Kennedys. very funny to me. This guy was an original punk. He produced Lexicon Devil for the germs, and now here he is making adult alternative secretary rock. I hate the world today. <sighs> but anyway, now we got to get to the actual song, and I'm, I'm sorry, this, this has always rubbed me the wrong way. I don't envy you. Okay, it's not that I'm put off by a woman being shamelessly bitchy. Let me first say that I get why the song was a hit, and that it was actually challenging for the time. And it's not because the title is a bad word. Meredith was nervous about that, and apparently some stations would not even say the title when they played it. But it wasn't the first song to say that word. You had the Stones, you had Elton John. No, the challenging part wasn't bitch. It was, I'm a bitch. I'm a bitch, I'm a lover, I'm a child, I'm a mother. That was a shocking statement. And that seems silly now, because the word bitch has been so thoroughly overused and reappropriated, it's more playful than harsh these days. You pay little bitch! Yeah, bitch! Magnets! Women still get called bitches, obviously, but they call themselves bitches. They call their friends bitches. Everyone calls everyone bitch. I'm a hundred percent that bitch. It's basically a pronoun at this point. But in the 90s, that word meant something. Not something good, but something. Or, I don't know, maybe I was just a little kid and all bad words were shocking to me in the 90s, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. So for Meredith Brooks to reclaim the word and say, yes, I am angry and unpleasant sometimes, and I'm not gonna apologize, that was a big deal. You know you want it any other way. And a lot of women did feel empowered by this, and if you see a lot of women proudly claiming the label these days, this song was probably a big part of why. A couple of years after Meredith, you had Missy Elliott singing She's a Bitch. She's a bitch. And that pretty much did it. From then on, we had bad bitches everywhere. So I get all that. I do. That's not my problem with the song. Okay, maybe it is a tiny bit. Take me as I am. I've known enough toxic people, men and women, who've done the whole, you know, I'm not perfect, you have to take me as I am. And it, it does remind me of excuses I've heard for some pretty awful behavior. So. That does put me on edge a little bit. This may mean you'll have to be a stronger man. <laughs> if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my Marilyn Monroe never said this. So there is a part of me that you know, says this song makes Meredith sound a little self-absorbed and erratic. Tomorrow I will change and today won't mean a thing. No, the things you do today do matter tomorrow. Whatever, let's not make this more than it is. That's not my real problem with the song. I'm an angel underneath. The thing is that being a bitch is not actually what the song's about. It's a major element, it's the name of the song, and you know, it's the majority of the verses, but it's not the main thing. I'm a little bit of everything, all rolled into one. The theme of the song is that being a bitch is just one of her many facets. A sinner, I'm the same. 
She's a bitch. She's a lover. She's a child. She's a mother. She's a sinner. She's a saint. I'm nothing in between. There are just so many pieces and characteristics and components to her. A woman contains multitudes. And I'm sorry, this shit just makes me roll my eyes into the back of my head. I'm a bitch, I'm a I'm a on my knees. You have multiple personality traits. You play many roles. You don't say. For her being older than most of her peers, this just sounds so adolescent. Now, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad, sometimes I'm fun, and sometimes I'm grumpy. Yeah, no shit, everyone has multiple dimensions. How is this an insight worth writing a song about? It is just pure fucking cornball, and the tone does not help it either. Any charge this song has comes from her dropping the B word, but the song otherwise is so edgeless. You Oughta Know was very much a bitchy song. And Just a Girl still fucking rips. But Bitch has the unthreatening, relatable tone of a viral post your aunt shared on Facebook. It kind of faints at being aggressive, but mostly it's just cute. Oh god, that felt good to say. But now that I've finally gotten that out of me, I actually feel a lot more kind to this song. I don't think anyone's gonna disagree or get mad at me for my issues with the song, but the song's 25 years old now. By this point, it's clear, no one cares. It stood the test of time. In the end, none of my complaints mattered, including to me, I realize now. What matters is that it's a song that goes, I'm a bitch sometimes, deal with it. The rest is window dressing. And despite me saying that it's edgeless, now that I really listen to it, it does actually rock a lot harder than I ever gave it credit for. And there is something about that hook. You can call it basic, but some songs can become so basic they come out the other side. They become iconic and universal. Like Creep by Radiohead is one of my favorite songs, so I don't know if I have room to complain about anything else being blunt and obvious. And on top of everything, it's just a really well-constructed song. That hook's pretty undeniable. I guess in the end, Bitch won out because I do indeed appreciate it despite its imperfections. It's a song that needed to exist. But the grand irony, of course, is that Meredith Brooks was trying to make the case that she was a multifaceted person, and yet she would always be defined by one song. I'm a bitch. She's a bitch. She's a... well, what else is she? What other parts of her did we not get to see? I need some good luck. I need a best friend. I need a rough dog. I need this is Meredith Brooks' second single, I Need. It's all about the billion things that she says that she needs. A week on an island, a diet that works. That's all I need. See how easy I am to please. That's this is hacktacular. I hate this. Cool friends, weekends, and someone to die for. It's so undercooked. The chorus is barely there. This is as cheesy as bitch, but without any of the power. There's no substance to the hook. It's just a lame, self-deprecating joke. See how easy I am to and look, Meredith Brooks really did not like being compared to Alanis Morissette. She thought of herself as more of a Cheryl Crow type. You know, that's who she thought she was going to have to defend herself from comparisons to. And I see what she means. She was a girl with a guitar. She probably started in a rootsier place than where she wound up. But the comparison is just unavoidable. They have similar singing styles. They have similar production. Their biggest songs were very brazenly, confrontationally female. The big difference is that Alanis was a much more interesting songwriter. Meredith wrote this one with Shelley Pikin too, and I, I think it's worth noting where Pikin went with her career. It sure wasn't angry riot girl alt rock. She made hits for Brandy, Christina Aguilera. Rotten to the core. What, seriously? Okay. Regardless, they both seem outmatched by this singer songwritery brand of rock, which demands something more thoughtful. I Need didn't chart. This is her other single, What Would Happen. What would happen if hot and sexy, and I think it's probably her best single. 
It did chart, but it landed outside the top 40. For what it's worth, Geza X has a different take on Meredith's failure to capitalize on her hit. He said he had more interesting plans for Meredith. He was going to push her into new sonic ideas, but the label decided they wanted someone safer and they brought in one of Sheryl Crow's collaborators and the result was a pretty uninteresting record. Meredith never really recovered from it. For what it's worth, the second album is better. It's like a lot of failed second albums I've heard on this show. It's more confident and sophisticated, but that one magic hook just wasn't there. Which is probably why the lead single is a cover. This is early 70s folk singer Melanie, best known for the twee novelty hit Brand New Key, but she had one other big hit in 1970s called Lay Down, parentheses, Candles in the Rain. Lay down, That's the one Meredith covered. Let's see how that turned out. What? Didn't see that coming. Okay, this song actually translates pretty well to the late 90s, but apparently they wanted to make it really stand out, so they got Queen Latifah to add a guest verse. Like, this seems like nothing now, but a song from an adult alternative artist having a rap verse on it, that's actually kind of bold and forward-thinking, actually. The song is still very middle-aged, though. I didn't even know Queen Latifah was still a rapper by then. After her second album tanked, she basically disappeared. She recorded a third album on a smaller label that immediately folded. It got re-released on a different label a couple years later, and the title track actually became the theme for Dr. Phil for a few years. She also wrote a whole album for Jennifer Love Hewitt. You know, I think that's as good a sign as any about how this moment in rock became slicker and poppier and then just ran out of gas. It started with Annie DeFranco and Tori Amos and it ended with the girl from I Know What You Did Last Summer trying to sing. She wrote a children's album in 2007 and then just seems to disappear from public life completely. Oh, except for a couple gossipy headlines she made in 2016 after she tweeted about how much she hated Hillary Clinton and how mean Hillary was being to Donald Trump. Huh. Well, that should dampen your enjoyment of this song forever. In fact, she seems to be contradicting the message of her one song. But as she repeatedly tried to tell us, she is a very complicated person with many contradictions. Don't check out her Twitter feed, you won't like it. I was thinking of being kinder to her, but uh, seeing where she is now, you know what, no. No. The 90s just had too many singer-songwriters who were just way more talented and way more interesting than Meredith Brooks. Her one statement to the world will remain, bitch, a gift to wine moms everywhere. I still don't think I'm a fan of this song, but it feels like the world would be missing something without it. It's relatable, it's universal, it's real dumb, it's controversial. It is perfect, it is lame, it could not be sustained. To some, this song will always represent the normie commercialization of the Riot Girl moment, and it's no surprise it fizzles out for Meredith. But she has her place in pop culture. She made being a bitch mainstream. Would you really want it any other way? I'm a bloke, I'm a knocker, and I really love your knockers. I'm a labourer by day. I piss up all me 